Good morning, and a warm welcome to Maxwell Merns today. We have some magazines and other literature at the back table. Transform magazine, which is the Scottish Bible Society's magazine. An excellent read. So there's two editions there. Please pick them up from the, the book table. We also have a, a newsletter. Maxwell Merns Castle News, April 2024. It's just a newsletter we've put together to tell you about some of the changes that have been happening over the last two or three weeks. Uh, we have a new interim moderator, a new session clerk, uh, somebody helping out with accounts, something, somebody helping Bob, uh, John Barclay. The chap's name's Bob Barclay, which makes it confusing. Uh, so somebody helping accounts, uh, New Scaifegarden Coordinator, Church Secretary, information on the cluster, uh, anything else, session meetings, and just general information. So this is uh, again on the book table. Please pick one up uh, as you leave. Okay. And lastly and sadly, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Bob Cowan had died Bob Cowan, who may be known to some of you. Uh, Bob's funeral will be this Thursday at 11, Thursday the 11th of April, 2 p.m. at the Hurlet, and it will be conducted by Scott. Uh, please pray for, for Bob Cowan's family at this time. So that's Bob, Bar Bob Cowan's funeral, Thursday, 11th of April, 2 o'clock at the Hurlet. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Let's worship the living Lord Jesus Christ and sing the splendor of the King. If you're able, please stand. I've heard it said that the roof tends to depart every now and then. 
Not this morning, please, Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, your people, gather here today, not because we deserve to be here, but because you and your love and mercy have called us back to yourself through Jesus Christ. We join with others in the worldwide church on earth to worship you, for you are a God who is alone worthy of praise. We thank you for all you give us, our families, friends, people who come alongside us. We thank you for that that others don't have or take for granted, food, fresh water, a health system. And as we give you our thanks, we ask that you help us care for each other. Lord, we acknowledge we've not lived or loved as you would have wanted us to. And so we come to you once more to ask for your forgiveness. To say sorry for the times we've taken you for granted. For the times when we've mistreated each other. For the times we've failed to treat each other with love and respect. Lord, we seek forgiveness in the knowledge that you're a father who loves to forgive when we approach you with humility. And we know we're assured of forgiveness if we're sincere because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from free, free evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Two weeks ago, I acknowledged we'd received this lectern. And I said that after Easter, we would dedicate the, the lectern in an appropriate manner. And so we're going to do that now. Many of you will have known Pamela Wilson, who we lost to ill health last September. Pamela's parents, Elizabeth and Robert Reaper, approached Maxwell earlier in the year and asked if they could donate a lectern to Maxwell in honor and in memory to their daughter, Pamela. We accepted this incredibly generous offer. And today we're delighted to dedicate the splendid lectern that graces our chancel in Pamela's memory. I didn't know Pamela, but from what I've learned about her, I'm the poorer for that. She left behind her husband, Rob, and children, Ruth, Ewan, and Gregor, and her sister, Linda. And they were active members in Maxwell in years past. Pamela and Rob were married in Maxwell. Pamela was the head teacher at Dunlop Primary School before leaving the teaching profession in 2021 to take up a position with Promise Scotland. Promise Scotland's a, govern, a government initiative, and it was created in order to provide, to, sorry, to develop integration of all the caring sectors involved with children in care from birth to 25 years old. This is a hugely important work, and Pamela loved working there and making a difference in the lives of these children and young adults. Her role was, was an, as, as an advisor and supporter of the agencies involved, for example, members of the children's panel. Life wasn't all work for Pamela, and in, in addition to caring and enjoying time with her family, she was very involved in outdoor activities, such as marathons, triathlons, sailing, sports of many kind. She was involved in dog agility. She loved dog agility, and she loved her own dogs dearly. The fair to say Pamela Wilson was a, a people person, and smiling came naturally to her. 
Appreciating people was something she did so well. And people always felt better for being in Pamela's company. She was a local community activist. And fighting against injustice or unfairness was close to her heart. Elizabeth and Robert, who have said Pamela's mum and dad, wish to donate this wonderful lectern in honour of Pamela's memory. And we are grateful recipients of that gift. So thank you on behalf of the congregation. May we honour Pamela and God in years to come through this lectern's place and use in this church. We'll now pray to ask God's blessing on Elizabeth and Robert and the family. And we'll ask God to dedicate this lectern to his work. So let's pray. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for your generous bounty towards us, shown in the generosity of those who have remembered with great thankfulness their loved ones who now dwell with you. As you have taught us to offer our praises in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, you also ask us to read your word and so build our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and bring enrichment to our worship. Lord, we ask you now to bless this lectern, which we dedicate to your service. We also ask you, our Heavenly Father, to bless the givers of this lectern that's donated in honor and in memory of their dear daughter, Pamela. May her memory live on in this church and in its people. And may this lectern be used to honor Pamela as well as to worship you. May you bless, comfort, and walk with Elizabeth and Robert and their family from this day on. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord singing, build your kingdom here.
The staple of any nutritious lunch, if you're on a diet. See, when I'm on a diet, I, I used to do this. I don't do it anymore, Mary. When I was on a diet, I wouldn't go for a Big Mac meal. I'll go for a Happy Meal because it's so much smaller. And I'd tell myself, this is so much better for you. What do we get in a Happy Meal? Well, we get the, I always get black coffee. I think McDonald's black coffee is okay. Mary thinks it's hideous. I'm quite happy with it. So you've got the coffee. It's empty now. I believe that was the paper, the, the hamburger. I didn't go for the cheeseburger. That's the extra calories. The hamburger was wrapped in, gone. The wee poke that the chips came in, gone. And I was really disappointed with this one because I didn't get a wee model I could build or something I could put stickers on. I got a game called Uno, which I know nothing about. Mary, you know something about this, sir? Family game. All I've got for a family is you and the dog. <laughs> so that's kind of useless too. And that's it. Finished. And even before it was finished, it wouldn't satisfy you for very long. The food's not very good. It's full of additives. Coffee's okay. But generally it's rubbish. It's not the best. It's a bit like life, isn't it? There's something we want, and we'll save up for it. With me, it's a guitar. Uh, I'm sure there's others in the room that can feel this one as well. It's a new guitar. Oh, I've seen it. It's got this, it's got that, Mary. If you press that button, it'll make you a cup of tea. Oh, this guitar. Can't wait for this guitar. And so I save up for the guitar. And I've got it. And I leave it on a guitar stand in the living room and just gaze longingly at it for about a week. And then it goes back in its case. And then after about two or three weeks, it's no longer the newer guitar. And the new guitar magazine comes out at the end of the month and, ah, Mary, look at this. This is coming out in two weeks' time. My life will be changed immeasurably if I have this guitar. Musicians call this gas, by the way, gear acquisition syndrome. And it never satisfies. Food doesn't satisfy. It does for a minute, maybe for an hour or two. And then you're hungry again. Objects don't satisfy. The new car is no longer the new car after the first stone chips appear in it. Nothing on earth satisfies. We think it does, and it does until the next thing comes along. Then that fills the gap, and then there's nothing. Today, at the end of the service, we're going to have a meal. Not a happy meal. We're going to have a meal that fills us. Just a tiny little bit of bread and a tiny cup of wine. 
but it fills a spiritual hunger. Because the bread represents the body of Christ, the wine, the blood of Christ. And that's all symbolic, and it, it sometimes can just appear as words in a liturgy. But it's what happens when we approach the table. Now, we don't approach the table. But spiritually, we do. Because we prepare ourselves for communion. There's always that gap before communion that allows us to make any confession, any ask for forgiveness for anything that's between us and God. And we do that time and time again. And that fills us spiritually. Anything on earth is passing. Transitory. Doesn't satisfy us for long. But we can find complete satisfaction in the Lord. What was it Jesus said? Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry or thirsty. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his gift of his life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus' death and resurrection. Thank you also for the satisfaction, the fulfillment, the purpose we find in you. For only you truly satisfy the hungers we have. Help us today to prepare ourselves for communion, to get rid of anything that's a barrier. And we take a moment to do that now. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing again. Remain seated. Jesus, lover of my soul. <coughs>
Our offering will be uplifted. God of wisdom and love, giver of all good things, we thank you for your loving kindness, for your constant care. We bless you for the gift of life, for your guiding hand upon us, your sustaining love within us. In response to your love and great gifts, we bring you our offering. Accept this and accept our lives in service to your kingdom. In Jesus' name your Son and our Saviour. Loving God, you care for all your creation and you seek its good. You care for every creature upon your earth and seek for them the space and resource to live in full. You know each home or shelter, each place where your people live. And you seek for them deep, deep peace in the knowledge and love of Christ. Bring to an end all that is evil in our world. All that exploits people and robs them of peace and fulfillment. Be with the people of Gaza and Israel at this time. As well as Ukraine and Russia and other war-torn regions. Bless with comfort all who are in trouble or pain. Heal those who are sick. Support those and console those who mourn. And be near those whom we now name in silence, Lord. Hear our prayer. Keep those who are absent from us within the protection of your love. And these are prayers we offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Martin. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from John 20. I am reading through verses 19 to 31. 
John 20, 19 to 31. And if you're on the Pew Bibles, uh, it's page 1089. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of this, his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Martin. What a week it had been for the disciples. Everything happened so fast. One minute, a crowd cheered Jesus as a hero when he entered Jerusalem. And a few days later, he was arrested, tortured and crucified. The disciples must have been shell-shocked. They'd been taken to the heights of joy and expectancy only to have their hopes crushed with Jesus' crucifixion. No wonder they gathered behind locked doors. They were afraid they were next. Their faith was severely dented when Jesus was killed so unjustly. It's little wonder they doubted the news of Jesus' resurrection. And what a day it had been. It began with Mary. She'd gone to the tomb early in the morning and found it empty. Peter and one of the disciples went racing to the garden and confirmed what Mary had said. Later, Mary came and told them that she'd spoken with Jesus. Imagine her excitement as she tried to share the news that she'd spoken to Jesus with these disciples. Although Mary delivered their amazing news, I think I can understand the difficulty the disciples might have had in believing it. Three days earlier, their Lord had been crucified. He was buried. How could she have seen him? It seemed impossible. And John's gospel said that the disciples' first response to the story was simply to dismiss it. Mary was so caught up in grief, she was seeing things. It was nonsense. That very evening, the disciples gathered again, once more behind locked doors not knowing what to think. And in the midst of their confusion, Jesus came and stood among them. His words for the disciples are words for us here and now, in this place today. Peace be with you. That was it. No long explanation. Just peace be with you. 
Just when things seemed hopeless, Jesus is there. Just when things seemed impossible, Jesus can help. When Jesus came to these broken disciples, their faith was so weak and their hopes dashed that he came to heal them of their weakness. He healed their broken spirits, restored their faith. Jesus transformed these disciples completely. You know, after Jesus' death, just about everything in the disciples' life was in tatters. They had nothing. Three years earlier, Jesus had said, leave your nets, leave your tax collecting, follow me, come and follow me. And they did. They left behind everything. Now with Jesus gone, they had nothing. What was their future now? Their leader was gone. And what's worse, they may be identified as one of his followers. They may end up with the same fate as him. Their faith was shaken because they trusted Jesus, believed in him. And when he was nailed to that cross, well, maybe he was just like us. Maybe he was just another man with a tall story. Their trust in God, everything they believed and lived for, had died with Jesus. These broken disciples needed healed, needed put back together, needed restored. And just when they'd given up hope, here was Jesus standing among them, alive as you and I. He was there to give them strength and healing, to give them a faith stronger than before. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And these fearful disciples hiding behind locked doors became powerful warriors. Many of them died martyrs' deaths. Many of them were crucified. Many have ended their lives in the Colosseum or the lion pits of Rome. From fearful people to fearless martyrs. Confident in Christ, even when facing death. What a transformation. But that night, behind locked doors, all the way were fearful until Jesus came. So we can understand how Thomas must have felt. I'll be honest, of all the disciples, I can get Thomas. These wee things of, these wee doubts that come into your mind. Usually come into my mind around one or two o'clock in the morning. Are you sure, Mike? Are you sure? Do they like me? Do they approve of me? Lord, where's my faith? I get doubting Thomas. He hadn't been there at the first gathering. He'd missed out. For him, darkness was still around him. Life was hopeless. His hope had died with Jesus, just as the same as the other disciples. And his future wasn't unsure. He was still unsure. He hadn't encountered the risen Christ. He was still filled with doubt. And a week later, Jesus came and stood before Thomas. The Thomas had already said to the other disciples, ha, he's not alive. You're joking. You're at it. Listen, unless I see for myself, I will not believe. Unless I can feel the marks of, his, of the nails in his hand, touch the wound in his side, I'm not going to believe it. Dead men don't walk. You can sense Thomas's misery, his grief, his separation. All the other disciples are, are rejoicing. We've seen our Savior. We've seen the Lord. You can't have. He's dead. They're rejoicing. They're in a different place. Thomas is still at day one. Still in pain. And I, can, I expect many of us can understand that. Because perhaps you've felt it yourself. You've trusted you've been, and you've been hurt. You've loved and lost. We've reached out in, rec in reconciliation only to be rejected. It's an everyday story. 
We've been where Thomas has been. Hurt and afraid to trust again. We can understand, Thomas, that he'll be slow to believe and reluctant to trust. Thomas must see for himself. He's nobody's fool. You saw Jesus. Yeah. You'll be telling me that the tooth fairy left two denarii under your pillow next. Nonsense. We saw him die. We saw his burial tomb. Thomas must see. You know, life can be cruel. Our experiences can cause us to mistrust and disbelieve anything that's not tried and tested. I know of some people who've had so many bad experiences in their life that that's all their expectation is. Disappointment. Might be better. <laughs> Never has been in the past. Don't come to me with your cozy homilies. It's going to be rubbish the same as it's always been. You may know people like that. You know, I feel so sorry for folk in that situation because, well, it's not really life at all, is it? You've been so hurt and let down that that's all your expectation is. They never expect the excitement of a pleasant surprise. Never know the peace that comes with knowing that God is with us. You know, when doubt dominates our lives, that's precisely what we lose peace with God and peace with ourselves. Thomas knew what it was like to live without peace. He'd experienced it for that whole week. And that's what this gospel reading is about this morning. A week of darkness. A week without hope. A week spent without Jesus. You know, when Thomas refused to believe, it wasn't just the other, the other disciples' word they doubted. It was life itself that he rejected. Life itself. It was a rejection of hope, a refusal to believe that life can have meaning. The story of Thomas shows us that the, there's no hope without the resurrection of Jesus. None. All we have is somebody who died on a cross. Without the resurrection, there is no Jesus. There is no Son of God. There is no Savior and Lord. There is no way to make sense of our earthly existence without God. But then that shouldn't surprise us. The Gospel writer John wrote, He who believes in the risen Christ has life, and who, he who does not believe is dead already. He who does not believe is dead already. That's what John said. When we allow doubt to dominate our lives, when we close ourselves off to the possibilities that God has for us, we effectively stop living. And we're in need of our own resurrection. But thankfully, doubt need not lead to death or a complete loss of faith. Because that's what Thomas is about as well. Listen to what Jesus said to Thomas when he appeared to him. We heard it read, verse 26. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt and believe. And Thomas believed. Thomas fell to his knees, my Lord and my God. He experienced his own resurrection from the darkness of that week. There's help for us when we find ourselves in doubt. When the world seems to collapse in upon us, all our props are knocked away. Take Thomas as an example. He made the mistake we often make, that I often make, I often think I can do it in my own strength. I can make it on my own until I can't. Devastated by the death of Jesus, he separated himself from the disciples. I do the same. When I'm having a hard time, I go away and sit on my own. 
poor Mary, because often she just can't touch me. I'm trying to work it out myself. A waste of time that is. You know, I live with a prayer partner. How stupid. But I fall for it every time. Just like Thomas. He needed time and space to work out his loss. He sought solitude in his pain and thought he could only trust in himself. But we can see that his doubts came from being absent from his disciples. Being separate and alone when Jesus appeared to the other disciples after his resurrection. Thomas's doubts were answered in the presence of the other disciples in community. And I think that's one of the main things that Christianity is about. It's about a people together, supporting each other, a body, each part doing each, each part doing its part, supporting the other parts. It was only in the fellowship of believers and only through the body of Christ that Thomas found assurance that he so desperately saw and needed. Put your finger here. Reach out your hand and touch me in my side. Stop doubting and believe. You know, when doubt dominates our lives, when doubt draws us apart from the church, then doubt is damaging. But when doubt leads us to look deeper for God, searching for his wisdom and goodness, reaching out to our brothers and brother or sister in Christ, then doubt can be such a blessing, just as it was for Thomas. For in the midst of doubt, Jesus is there. Jesus is there. Even when things seem darkness, darkest, a light shines. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I'm not pretending it's jelly and ice cream every day. I'm not saying that's what Christianity is about at all. Because in Thomas, we have permission. We have permission to be in that dark place for a while. We have permission to struggle. We have permission to cry. I don't think it's God's design or certainly not Jesus' purpose that we stay there. But we're allowed, providing we reach out. Providing after a while we reach out. With doubts and questionings clouding our vision, when troubles and difficulties close our eyes to the goodness of God, we need to move closer to our Savior. We need to draw more deeply into worship, spending more time reading and praying and reach out more strongly to our sister and brothers in the faith. Mature faith, a faith that serves us for a lifetime, is not a faith that has never experienced doubts. In some of our hymns, our choruses, we sing about the refiner's fire. When we're going through these dark places, that's our refining. A mature faith is not a faith that's never experienced doubts. Rather, it's a faith that constantly searches and seeks. A mature faith is always on lookout for Jesus. A faith that trusts, even when the worst can happen, we'll discover in the middle of that catastrophe there are others standing by us, and there is Jesus. Jesus said, peace be with you. Do not doubt, but believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that's his promise to us. Peace be with you. Do not doubt, but believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. In Jesus' name, amen. As we approach the Lord's table, we sing, here is love vast as the ocean. We stand to sing.
This is the table of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord invites us to share in this joyful feast. In this feast comes the root of our joy. In this feast gleams the glory of heaven's high. In this feast, Christ comes, the King of all, the Lord Almighty. This table is open to all who love the Lord Jesus, regardless of denomination or membership, and we share as one people of Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, hope of your people, hope of your world. Touch our lives now as we gather before you and approach your table. Come to us that we might sense your presence in and around us. Shine in our hearts. Bring light to our mind and our spirits so that we will grasp more clearly the hope that you give us. The assurance of your love and the joy of life in all its fullness, here and now and for all eternity. And we make this prayer in the name of our risen Lord Jesus. Amen. According to the holy institution and the example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial to him, we do this, who on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he'd given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. When the bread and wine comes out, please hold on to it. We'll eat the bread together and then drink the wine together. The body of Christ, broken for us, eat in remembrance of him. body of Christ. The body of Christ broken for us, eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink from it, do so in memory of me. The blood of Christ shed for us.
The blood of Christ shed for us, drink in remembrance of him. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass human understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We've shared in the, the body and blood of Christ just turn to your neighbors, walk about, and share the peace of Christ with each other. Peace of Christ, Andrew. Peace of Christ, Mary. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, Norman. Do you want to go back? Do you want to go back? Yeah. As a matter of fact, go back. <laughs> We close our time together standing to sing Stuart Townend's arrangement of the Lord's My Shepherd, I Will Trust in You.
please remember the Transform magazines and other magazines at the, at the book table and the newsletter. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. Go in the strength of God, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all and those whom we love, now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>